our first speaker this morning <laughs> is Elizabeth McCormick. She will soon host a brand new television show about war veterans that starts filming this year. She is currently number four on the list of leadership experts to follow on Twitter and is a best-selling author with more than 18 published books on business. Yeah, you heard that right. With more than 18 published books on business and leadership topics. Elizabeth's keynote speaking career has rocketed since she started full-time in 2010, speaking an average of 100 engagements per year. And yes, they are paid. She has global clients such as Coca-Cola, Charles Schwab, Novitas, Krispy Kreme, Nestle, and many more. But you know what I think the really cool thing about our next speaker is? As an army Black Hawk pilot. I'll say that again. As an army Black Hawk pilot. <laughs> yeah. Elizabeth flew command and control, air assault, repelling, and top secret intelligence missions, missions, and also transported high-level government VIPs such as the Secretary of Defense. In 2011, Elizabeth was awarded the U.S. Congressional Veteran Commendation. Guys, let's fly to the video. It is our pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, former U.S. Army Black Hawk pilot, Elizabeth McCormick. morning, and some of you, your coffee hasn't kicked in yet, but I'm going to require maximum participation this morning, so let's try that again. Can you handle the truth? Yes. Because the truth is, I almost failed flight school. But before I tell you about flight school, I need to tell you how I got there. Would that be okay? Yeah. And along the way, I'm going to share with you the lessons that I learned that serve me in life and business and can help you too. Sound good to you? Yeah. All right, then let's get started. You see, I was an unemployed military wife. I had just graduated from college with a degree in art, a minor in mathematics, and an associate's degree in engineering. Yep, couldn't get a job. But that was because we were stationed at Fort Polk, Louisiana, a little tiny base out in the marshland of western Louisiana. Didn't even have a Walmart. There was nothing there, and I couldn't get a job. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I got a job. Yep, working in a pizza place. Five years of college. My parents, including my mom, were not proud. So one night I looked at my 
starter, husband. All right, now who else has a starter spouse? Don't laugh too hard, you might still be on yours. And I looked at him and I thought if he could be in the army, why can't I? So I decided to join the army, but I wanted the coolest job possible. (laughs) Yeah, I didn't know what that was. (laughs) So I went on to the base and I asked around. I said, if you could do anything, what would you do? If you had to do it over, what would you do different? And finally I asked, what's the coolest job? Well, in the United States Army, what's the coolest job? Being a pilot. So I said, okay, I'll do that. Didn't know it was hard. Didn't know the Army had only let women into aviation about 12 years before that, and the Army, in all their cautiousness and prudence, they were only letting those women in one at a time. One at a time. One at a time to see how it worked out. See, I I didn't know any of that. I just knew that it felt right. So I went out to the flight line where the helicopters are to research it some more. And as I pulled my car off to the side of that dirty, dusty road, you know how when you get out of the car in the summer and the heat and humidity hits you like like an oven, right? It's like... And I got out of the car and walked down the ditch through knee-high grass and got up to an embankment to a chain-link fence that protected the helicopters. And I poked my fingers through and gripped that hot gray metal as I looked at the helicopters for the very first time. And I went, Have you had those moments? Have you had that yeah moment where you know you're in the right place at the right time, doing the right things, helping the right people? If you've had that moment, say yeah with me. Yeah, yeah, I had that moment. And I had the vision. I had the vision of myself out on that flight line, flying those helicopters, wearing a flight suit that could still fit, thanks to Spanx. (laughs) It could happen. Here's the thing. I didn't have to know the how to believe. I didn't have to know how it was gonna happen to believe it was going to happen. We believe in ourselves, our abilities, our potential first. We figure out the how along the way. But if you don't believe, do you even see the opportunities that are in front of you? It starts with your belief. I call that being in the potential zone. Because in your comfort zone, you get what you already got because you're going where you've already been. The magic happens in your belief of your potential, the potential of the situation, the potential of your client and that event and and where you can take them. It starts with your belief in that. I had that. I walked inside to talk to the pilots. Didn't occur to me they were all men. They told me the next step to become a helicopter pilot, and the next step was going to the recruiting station. So I need to ask, how many of you have served in in your country's military? Please raise your hand high and proud. Yes, please, a round of applause. Let's honor them. Keep your hand up. Keep your hand up. Now, how many of you have had any family member who has served in your country's military forces. Please raise your hand high and proud. Now let's look around the room. Give me a round of applause for the families too. Because the families serve too. It's tough on the families, isn't it? Yeah. So let me just fill you in what this looks like. Because when you go to a recruiting station where you sign up to join, when you open the door to that recruiting station to walk in, the fresh air you let in, activates their saliva glands. They start drooling. They get really excited. And when I walked in, the recruiter goes, oh, 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 we have openings for a cook today. (laughs) 
was I not just working in a pizza place? A cook. I said, no, 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 no. I want to go warrant officer flight training program. I had done my research. I knew what to say. I could say it with confidence. And he looked at me and he said, you can't do that. Now, anytime you are faced with a can't, you always have a choice. You could believe in them, or you could believe in yourself, your abilities, your potential, and the potential of the situation. It is always a choice. So I looked at him, and with curiosity, no attitude, I asked him, why not? Why not? What is standing in my way? I will challenge you to be more curious, to ask more questions, to really find out what's going on behind. And when I asked him why not, he said, well, 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 you need perfect eyesight. I have that. Why not? Well, 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 you need perfect physical condition. I used to have that. I was a little younger then. <laughs> Why not? Well, 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 you need a college degree. Ha! Huh. I almost have three. Why not? Well, well, you need leadership. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have that too. Why not? Well, well, because... Uh... Uh... Uh, help me out, what did he say? And then I asked him, what did I ask him? And he said, what do you think he said? Yeah, because of my gender, because I was a girl, female, how many do you think that's the reason why? He said, you can't do this. Go ahead, it's okay. Yeah, here is what he said. I don't know how to do that paperwork. <laughs> yeah. He didn't know how to do his job. I mean, can you imagine if I had walked in and I had believed in him instead of me? Would I become a helicopter pilot? Would I now be this, the motivational speaker I am traveling all over the world, including being here with all of you today? No. My entire future changed because I was willing to believe in myself, my abilities, my potential more than someone else's lack of belief. So let me tell you what I did. I sat in his office, I read the regulations, and I did the paperwork for him. I did his job, because when it really, really comes down to it, your future is your responsibility. It is up to you. Your business is up to you. It's not up to anyone else, is it? It becomes a you and you in the mirror kind of thing. It's up to you. No one else can make it happen like you. Oh, I had to go to the flight doctor to take my flight physical, and the flight doctor looked at me and he said, little girl, don't you know flight school is really hard? What makes you think you can do this? You are wasting my time. And I looked at him with my confidence and said, sir, I have an appointment. Let's just take the physical. And we did. And when I went to take my testing, I had to take the flight aptitude skills test. They call it the fast test. Ha! Huh? It's really slow. <laughs> the examiner, the sergeant issuing the test, he looked at me and he said, Young lady. Now, let me just pause here for a second. Gentlemen in the room, let me just fill you in on a little tip, a little bonus. 
we don't like that. <laughs> All right? We don't like to be called little girl and young lady. You know, we have names. Please use. Just a little side tip, bonus there. He said, don't you know this test is really? What makes you think you can do? You are wasting my? Huh. Y'all have heard this before. I looked at him with my confidence and said, Sergeant, I have an appointment. Let's just take the test. And we did. It wasn't until later that I found out that when my packet had gone to the Pentagon, all those test results, all that paper, had gone to the Pentagon for what they call a selection board, where they determine who is going to get the spots in flight school for the entire United States of America. That when my packet went to the Pentagon, they only had two spots, two pilots in the entire nation they selected. And I had received one of those. <laughs> I have to tell you, if I had known that up front, I would not have been so confident in all those situations. I would have been a lot more nervous and a lot more timid and a lot less likely to believe. Are we meant to know how difficult things are? No, we're meant to believe. We're built for it. Because if you believe something is hard, it's going to be. And if you believe something is easy, it's going to be. Not as hard. <laughs> Not as hard. Because what you believe, does it show up? Right? Does it show up and impact your outcomes? And your outcomes determine your legacy. Yeah. It shows up, what you believe. <sighs> so I went through basic training. Then I went to Warren Officer Candidate School, at that time one of the toughest schools the Army had. You see, there was no male or female standard. There was a Warren Officer standard. Do you think they were lowering the standards for those girls they were letting in? No. I had to meet the same physical standards as the men. How many of you believe men and women are built the same physically? <laughs> yeah, me neither. <laughs> we're not. It's not a bad thing. It's amazing. I talk at a lot of colleges at times. And... Uh, there are, there are students that say yes. <laughs> and I'm like, you need to go to class. <laughs> Please. We're not. But I had to run two miles, three miles, four miles, five miles, in boots, in gear, next to the men at their pace, not mine. I had to do push-ups up on my toes. No knees, ladies. The same as the men. At the end of that six-week training course, I could do 83 push-ups in two minutes. Wow. Yeah, yeah, I used to be really buff. <laughs> yeah, not anymore. That's okay. So, but it was what I had to do. And at that time, I had to push myself harder physically than I ever thought I had within me. It's that potential zone. And then I got to flight school. Aeromed training, aerodynamic training. I had to know the systems of a Huey helicopter. I had to know every single component, what it was called, what it did, what happened if it failed, and what was my emergency procedure to recover for every single component. How many of you can do that for your automobiles? Yeah. It wasn't easy, and I was the only girl in the class. They didn't slow it down for me. And then it was that day. <sighs> the day we get to learn how to fly. I mean, would you be excited to learn how to fly a helicopter? I'm about to teach you how to fly a helicopter. Are you excited to learn how to fly a helicopter? Yeah. And so you know how it is when you're excited about something? Have you noticed that you walk different? Have you noticed you walk different? It's, it's called the strut, right? We walk the quarter mile the whole way like that. And we get in, and I find my name on the list, who my instructor pilot is, and I, I find my name, and I walk up to the table, Chief Mac, that's what they called me, it was Chief Mac, Chief Mac, reporting in. Yes, so excited, we get to fly. And he looks up at me from his desk, at the paperwork, and he looks up at me and he goes, oh, great. You see, he didn't believe women should fly. 
So in order for you to understand what flight school is like, I need to teach you how to fly a helicopter today. So in order to fly a helicopter, you're gonna need both hands and both feet if you are able. So flat on the floor, feet on the floor, both hands and feet. So you can set your paper and your devices down. I promise they'll still be there when you're done. So, ready? So in order to fly a helicopter, the first thing that you need to know is there's a cyclic. The cyclic is a stick. It goes down to the floorboard, up into the rotor systems, and controls the pitch on the rotor blades. Okay, so with your right hand, I want you to take your, extend your right hand straight out with a fist. That is where your cyclic would be in the helicopter. Okay, so it controls the direction. So if you want to go forward, you're going to push it forward and lean forward. Yes, this is the participation part. <laughs> lean forward. Now, if you want to go to the side, we're all, as a whole room, we're all going to go that way. You want to go to the side, we're going to push and lean to the side. There we go. Now we're going to go to the other side. And if you want to go back, whoa, 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 you have a tail back there. You pull it too far back, you hit your tail. That's bad. Don't hit your tail. Now, why did you put your hand down? You are flying the helicopter. <laughs> there is no autopilot. You are on the controls now. You take your hands off the controls, you'll crash. So you're flying the helicopter. Your arm is straight out. That's a cyclic. With the left hand, I want you to imagine your elbow is pinned to the floorboard. You can only pull up the front part of your hand. It's a lever off the floorboard. The higher you pull it, the more fuel goes into your engine. So the higher you pull it, the more airspeed you get. The higher you pull it, the more altitude you get. And the higher you pull it, if you can really pull it high, you can get both airspeed and altitude at the same time. So go ahead and pull some power because it feels really good. Yep. All right. So that's your collective. So while you're doing that, here's what happens in the helicopter. We're flying straight like this, and you pull power up. What happens is the power goes to the tail. So even though we're flying straight, we pull power and the tail does this. Sorry. We're flying straight like this and our tail is off to the side. Is this aerodynamic? No! So with your feet, independently of each other, push on the foot pedals, which controls the pitch of the tail rotor blade to get your tail behind you where it belongs. So go ahead and push on the pedals all at the same time. But wait, there's more. Because while you're doing all that, you also have a center console of avionic and navigation equipment to tell you who to talk to and where to go. And then you have four feet of instrument panel you're scanning to stay in your system limits. Because even though some of you are crashing, <laughs> you do know I can see you. Come on, hands on the controls. You have four feet of instrument panel you're scanning to make sure you stay in your system limits because even though we are in the air, there are speed limits. There's just no signs. <laughs> you have to have all those limits memorized. And while you're doing and scanning all that, you also have windows. You have a front windshield, you have a door window right here, and you have what's called a chin bubble window down at your feet. In fact, right now, I want you to look down at your toes through the table if you need to, because when you lose your engine, that's where you're going to go. <laughs> there is no glide in a helicopter. You're going straight down all at the same time. And so those windows become really important because you don't want to hit a tree or a power line, or another aircraft. Those are bad. Don't hit those. All at the same time. But wait! Because while you're doing that, you have a helmet on. And with your helmet, you have a microphone, and you're talking internally to your crew, and externally to air traffic control. I mean, there is no such thing as a quiet pilot. All at the same time time. And if you are sitting there thinking, what does that have to do with me? I can, I can see your faces, by the way. Yeah. Every time you walk into your office, even in your pajamas, every time you show up at work in your business, you are in the pilot seat. Is there autopilot? 
Now maybe Gil has some and, and with some effort, but you're still, steering, you're still piloting the ship, right? Yeah. You are in the pilot seat. There's no autopilot. It's up to you to make things happen. You are on the controls. And it's multitasking just like flying, isn't it? I have to tell you, of every, any industry I've been in, and I worked in corporate and have done other things, speaking business is the most ADHD business I've ever been in. <laughs> because when the phone rings, do you have to answer it? When they need a proposal to make a decision tomorrow, do you need to send in a proposal and drop everything and send that? Okay, the answer to that is yes. Right? Because if they don't get you, who are they calling? The next person on the list. It is up to you to multitask and manage. Some of you look really tired. You can put your arms down now. Yeah, it is up to you. You are in the pilot seat, and there's no autopilot. But flying a helicopter, well, it is kind of like something else. How many of you are my roller coaster fans? Let me see you. Let me see, let me see, let me see, let me see. I, I have to tell you, I don't believe you. Because if you were a true roller coaster fan, you would have two arms up. <laughs> no self respecting roller coaster fan does one hand. Let's see ya. Where are my roller coaster fans? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So I want you to imagine you're riding a roller coaster and you are in the front car. You know how when you're in the front car, you see everything that's coming, it's really smooth? I want you to imagine you're in the front car of the roller coaster and there is no track. You get to decide where it goes. How high, how low, how fast, or how slow. To the right or to the left, which way it should go. That is what flying a helicopter is like. It's really cool. And flying a helicopter, the first you maneuver you must learn is how to hover. Hovering is when you're eight to 10 feet off the ground, I know it's not meters, off the ground and the wind whips off the rotor system, it comes down and hits the helicopter and it buffets the helicopter and it comes up and it makes it the helicopter aerodynamically unstable. I mean, it is so aerodynamically unstable, it's like the bumblebee that shouldn't fly but doesn't know any better and flies off anyway. It's aerodynamically unstable, and hovering is the first maneuver you must learn because it's how you get up off a landing pad and you go anywhere. Hovering is first. And hovering requires a very soft touch on the controls. A soft touch is best. But what happens to that soft touch when your flight instructor is screaming at you? <clears throat> You're stupid. Stupid, you don't deserve to be here. You are wasting my... What makes you think you can do? And my least, <laughs> my least favorite of them all, he would say to me, a monkey can fly better than you every day. And do you think that soft touch I needed to fly, do you think it stayed soft? <sighs> no. And I'd go too far to the right and back too far to the left and back too far to the right and back too far to the left and we would start doing what's called a pendulum maneuver. Yep, that's a prohibited maneuver. Don't do that one. And he would take the controls away from me and he would yell at me again. Day over day became week over week and I am failing. Halfway point of the course, failing. The beginning of the fifth week, that Monday morning, that potential zone in my head. I know I'm supposed to be here. I go into the commander's office. Sir, I'd like an instructor change. <laughs> Denied. Sir, could we? No. But sir, what if we? No. Go back to class. Yes, sir. And as I got to the door, I turned back to the commander, and I said, sir, 
with all due respect, I will not quit. You cannot make me quit. I'm gonna show up and I'm going to bring the best of my abilities every single day. Because when things get hard, let's pause there. It's a when, isn't it? It's not an if. It's not an if. We all have our days when things don't go our way. We all have the days where we have health issues or family issues or things just don't go the way we would hope. We all have our days. And some of those days last really long, don't they? Here's the thing. You show up. You bring your best. Because sometimes that's all we can control. Maybe your flight gets in at 3 o'clock in the morning for an 8 a.m. presentation. You bring your best. Maybe your luggage gets lost. You bring your best. No matter what it is, bring your best. Because that is your mission, isn't it? So I showed up the sixth week, still failed. The seventh week, there's now only this week, and next week is the final exam, where in aviation it's called a check ride, where we have to prove we can do the maneuvers. I don't know how this is going to happen, but I show up. But you remember that strut from the beginning, right? Do you think it still looked like that? No, here's how it looked like, and maybe you can relate to this, it's happened to you before. Very long walk. And as I walked in that Monday morning of the seventh week, I looked up. He wasn't there. Yes! I'm thinking I got a shot. I have a chance, and I could do this. But as I walk in, he is looking at all my grade sheets. Is that a good first impression? No. As I walked up to the table, I said to him, the only thing I, th thing I th could think of, how you doing? And he goes, what's the deal? <sighs> I mean, what could I possibly say that would excuse that kind of result? What could I say that wouldn't sound like I was blaming someone else? What could I say that would take responsibility for that? I had nothing. Nothing. Have you ever had a situation where you just don't know what to say? I know we're speakers. That doesn't happen often. Have you ever been in those situations? Yeah, three of you. Yes. I'm not the only one. Yeah. I didn't know what to say. I froze. And then, oh, it came to me. The perfect response to a difficult situation. And if you are taking notes, if you write anything down, in my time with you, this is the one you want to write down. It's write down what to say in a difficult situation. If you take notes on your device, that's good. I do that too. Go ahead. I will, I'll wait for you. What to say in a difficult situation. It's all right. I can see you. It's good. All right. He had asked me, what's the deal? And here is what I said. I'm trying really hard. <laughs> and then he yells at me. And then he tells me a monkey can fly better than me. And I really want to see that monkey fly. <sighs> yeah. Did I mention crying in uniform in the military is really bad? I mean, it is really bad. And admittedly, he's like this. Please stop, please stop, please stop, please stop, please stop, please stop. And I had to stop. And I had to dry it off. And then he looks at me and he says the four words I really want you to write down. They're the four words to say to yourself whenever things get hard. They're the four words to help you stay connected and committed to your passion and why you do what you do that will drive you through hard times. And those four words are, do you want this? Whenever things get hard, thank you. I didn't say it, he did. 
Whenever things get hard, ask yourself, do I want this? Reconnect to that commitment. Reconnect to that passion. Reconnect to the difference that you make because you do. That becomes your legacy. <sighs> do I want this? Oh, yes, I responded. He says, great, let's teach you. <laughs> awesome. You know how you're so close to something? Have you ever been so close to something where you make one little tweak, one little change, one little shift, and everything falls into place? Has that ever happened to you? Yeah. He taught me how to hover in one day. One day. Hey, would you like to learn how to hover today? Say yes. yes. Raise your right hand up. Raise it straight up in the air. Go ahead and stretch that a little bit. Take a deep breath in. Now bring it down and put your elbow against your rib cage with your elbow braced against your rib cage. Pivot your hand forward. That is where your hand should be for the cyclic. And with your elbow braced against your rib cage, how smooth and stable is your wrist? Now try it without the brace. It's a big difference. He taught me how to create a stable platform by bracing my elbow. One thing. Isn't that funny how that can happen in our business too? One little tweak, one little change, one little shift of our brand, our language, and everything can fall into place. And you can create a stable platform for your business. One thing. This new substitute instructor, Chief Rosh, he, he taught me more in one week then my original instructor, his name was Dick. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. Then he had taught me it all. And the next week when Dick came back from his week vacation going, fail, he couldn't fail me. I knew just enough to pass. But it was ugly. Have you ever had the ugly pass? Do not raise your hand. Just wink at me. I got you. Yeah, because practice makes, really? How could it possibly be perfect when all my practice was wrong? We need to shift our paradigm on this. Practice makes permanent. How we practice determines how we perform. How we practice determines how we show up. How we live in our life, how we work in our business every single day has an impact and influence on something tomorrow, doesn't it? So be more intentional, be more focused, be more deliberate, because practice makes, it's a shift of thinking, isn't it? Yeah. Every single thing you procrastinate on does it impact tomorrow. Not a trick question. Yeah. And the things we choose to do impact tomorrow as well. And how we practice our stagecraft, does that show up when you're on stage? You need to practice everything as if it was for real because it shows up in our muscle memory and what we do. Because practice makes last time permanent. It's a shift of thinking. Now, I have time to teach you one lesson. One lesson before I go into the closing story of almost crashing a helicopter. So I'm going to give you a choice. Would you like to learn about a simple framework for leadership or would you like to learn a few things about how I get 100 speaking engagements a year? Which one would you rather have? <laughs> Shout it out to me, A or B? B. Oh, I figured that. <laughs> All right, so let's, let me talk you through the SOAR process. SOAR. And I put, went ahead and put all of them up on the slide so you can write them down or take a picture of them right up front instead of dripping them in. The SOAR process, this is how I make decisions. Anytime I'm going to make a marketing decision or decide what to do, I run it through these four questions. The first one, can I make it a superior experience? That's all about quality. Can I do it in a better way, at a higher quality that makes it a superior experience for the audience, for the meeting planner, right? Because we don't have just one customer, do we? If the meeting planner is happy, but the audience isn't, does that work? No. And if the audience is happy, but the meeting professional isn't, do we have another problem? Right? We have to satisfy them both. So how can we make it a superior experience? And Frederick, where's Frederick? Yeah, don't be a diva. So, or like my flight instructor, don't be a... 
There you go. Thank you. He said it. I didn't. Okay. So superior experience. The next one is oversize it. Can you make it bigger? Can you ma take your stage presence and make it bigger? Can you take your book launch and make it bigger? What can you do in a bigger way that shows up in a bigger space? Every single decision, can I make it bigger? Can I oversize it? The next one is accelerate it. Can I get it to market faster? Can I get my book out faster? It's a brand new hot topic. Can, should, should I bring in virtual reality or artificial intelligence or something else faster than any other speaker might? Right? Faster. What can I do faster? And the last one is rarity and clarity. How can, and I've heard it so many times here over the last few days, is how can we make it more unique? How can we stand out in a different way? I don't know any other pilots who speak who took their old flight suit and added rhinestones. <laughs> right? Next level, rhinestone cowboy boots with flags on them for the American market. Right? What can you do to differentiate yourself and make you more rare, but rarity with clarity? Right? Because if it's clear to you but not to anyone else, it's not going to do you any good, is it? Yeah. Pretty cool? Yeah. Thank you. All right. So last story. I was at Fort Drum at my first duty assignment. Now, Fort Drum is in the upstate New York in the Adirondack Mountains, not far from Lake Placid. Snows every month but July. I knew I was in trouble when they issued me a snowblower, not a lawnmower. I'm thinking I don't need that. While I was there, it snowed five feet of snow in May. That's our spring. Five feet of snow was the accumulation. The drifts were seven to eight feet high. And it was cold. Go ahead and ask me, how cold was it? How cold was it? It was so cold. And the army was so good to us. Okay, that's part of the joke. <laughs> They're not known for being good. That when it was colder than negative 30 Fahrenheit, they would let us do physical fitness inside. It was cold. And I was there during the 1998 Great North American Ice Storm. It was one of those ice storms that happens once in 100 years. The ice fell for 115 hours. 115 hours of freezing rain. It accumulated more than four inches thick on the trees, houses, cars, roads. The roads were impassable because the snow plows and the chemicals those Americans use wouldn't cut through the ice. It fell too fast, too thick. And that ice fell four inches thick on power lines. The entire infrastructure for upstate New York, Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, and big sections of Canada decimated. Over five million people were without power. Some were without power for three months. Can you imagine not having power for three months? And this happened in the dead of winter. It was cold. People were dying. FEMA, our emergency activation administration, they were activated, but they couldn't get through because of the condition of the roads. Now at Fort Drum, we knew the storm was coming because we had a weather pattern like this. We knew the storm was coming, so we had hangered all of our helicopters. And when they built the base, the military base at Fort Drum, they had buried all the power lines, and we had our own electrical grid, so we were completely self-sufficient, you know, just in case something happened with the Canadians. <laughs> Where are my Canadians? Yeah, not really. Okay, just, just, that was a joke. Just kidding. We knew it was coming. So we got the call from the governor of New York. The governor needed two Blackhawks to fly FEMA. The governor. Well, and a lot of other people, and we wondered why it takes so long for help to get where it's needed. And I got the call, I was on the mission. Now it's gonna be a tricky mission because it's cloudy and clouds are made of water, moisture. And it's below freezing, and that makes, that was our science quiz. Thanks, Glenn. It was made ice. So we're gonna be flying instrument mode in the clouds in icing in a Black Hawk helicopter. Would anyone like to go? Real mission, people were dying. We have to go. So I'm on, I, it's decided I'm going to be on the controls. Well, we get an updated weather briefing. And the updated weather briefing is that we're only going to be in the clouds and the icing for the first 45 minutes 
of the flight. The second 45 minutes of the 90-minute flight will be visual. And when we're visual, we're not in the clouds. We're not in the clouds. We're not in icing. It's a safer flight mode. So it's an IFR instrument mode in icing to a visual VFR visual flight mode. Mission. Anyone feeling better and want to go? Now, not to worry. The Blackhawk has a sophisticated anti-icing, de-icing system. It's so sophisticated, I can't describe the system. <laughs> Here's what you need to know. Two. In order for the anti-icing and de-icing systems to work, I need two out of two engines at full operational. Very, very important. How many engines do I need? Two engines at full operational power. We get ready to go. Derek is in the left seat. I'm in the right seat. I am the co-pilot. I'm a chief warrant officer, too, but I am a co-pilot. In the left seat is Derek. Derek is our pilot in command. We're the same rank military-wise, but he has achieved pilot and command status, I have not. Behind us are two crew chiefs to maintain the helicopter, and this is what the inside of the helicopter looks like. And behind those two crew chiefs is a row of seats. It's not like an airplane. There are no aisles. The seats go all the way across. If you want to change rows in flight, you have to get out. The seats are back to back to each other, so you've got a second row of seats, so the backs support each other. And then in the very back along the far wall, is shockingly another row of seats. And in that back row of seats is sitting a colonel from our brigade. We're down here at the platoon. There's a company, there's a battalion, there's a brigade. He's four levels up the chain of command. He, we don't know him, but he is our liaison to the governor of the entire state. We get ready to go. Derek decides I'm going to fly the helicopter and he's going to navigate and talk to air traffic control. So we get ready and we come up to a hover to test and test everything. And I, let me just insert in here. I am really good at hovering now. Yeah, so I come up to a hover. Everything looks good. And we get our clearance and I pull more power, more power, more power. The tail kicks out, the feet come back, and then <laughs> we punch into the clouds. It is like being on the inside of a marshmallow. You can't see anything but white, except I do see something. Ice building on the windshield and around the metal surfaces, every surface I can see, ice getting thicker, 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 right in front of my eyes. Let me tell you the clench factor was high. You know the one I'm talking about, right? But you know how it is when you're stressed? The longer you're stressed, the more used to it you get, don't you? It becomes a new normal. And I'm flying the helicopter, and everything's responding fine, so we start relaxing a little. And 15 minutes or so into the flight, all relaxed, and everything's working functionally, I hear it. <laughs> Master, caution, alarm. Oh, shh. Do you think what we really said? Yeah. This is bad. We're in the icing, in the clouds, real mission, colonel on board, and we have master caution alarm. Is this a good thing? This is bad. I'm on the controls flying. Now, when something goes wrong in your car, you get a shimmy, a shake, a vibration, something that tells you something goes wrong, right? Or maybe you hear something. You hear a thud, a thump, something that tells you something is going wrong, right? Same thing in a helicopter. I'm flying the helicopter, and everything's responding normally. So I turn and look at Derek, the pilot in command. Derek, we have a master caution alarm, but we're maintaining our altitude, our airspeed, everything looks good. And here is Derek. Oh my gosh, 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 oh my gosh. Ah, ah, ah. Is this a good thing? <laughs> have you ever been in moments where you think, they're not going to help much? Yeah, I'm on the controls flying. I turn and look at him and realize he's not going to help. I start doing his job, too. I start scanning the instruments, and I find it one gauge in the middle. Up and down, up and down, up and down. RPM and engine number two. We're in the clouds and the icing. How many engines do I need? How many do I have if one's going up and down, up and down, up and down? Is this good? This is bad. I'm on the controls flying. I turn and look at Derek. Derek, we have a master caution alarm. We have fluctuating RPM and engine number two. Here's Derek. Oh my gosh, 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 ah, 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 fluctuating RPM, we need to take the engine off. It was at that moment I realized engine number two is over my head. Our helicopter's loud? Yeah. Engine number two over my head was steady. The gauge was going up and down, up and down. 
The gauge, the engine data goes into a computer. The computer puts it into a gauge. We were okay. We had a chip malfunction in our computer. So I turn and look at Derek, still flying the helicopter. Derek, we have a master caution alarm fluctuating RPM engine number two. I know it's a two computer chip malfunction. We're okay. Do you think he heard me? What did he do? <laughs> oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Fluctuating RPM on engine number two and he reaches up and grabs the throttle in the ceiling panel to take the engine off. Now, he pulls that throttle back, we lose our anti-icing, de-icing capability, ice forms on our lift surfaces, and we crash an $18 million at that time helicopter with a crew of four and a colonel on board. Let me ask you, I taught you how to fly, right? You're on the controls in this situation. You're the one flying. What would you do? Okay, y'all are violent. <coughs> you might want to watch who you sit by at lunch today. Just saying. So let's think about this. If you take your hands off the controls to hit him, I heard you. Do you create a whole new set of problems? Yeah. There's no autopilot, is there? No. Think about this for your business. If you are taking your hands off the controls of your business to worry about what other people are doing and comparing yourself to others that aren't in your space, what's happening? You're off the controls, right? You're out of control. There's no autopilot, is there? Is there an autopilot in your business? No, you are on the controls. You are in the pilot seat. So I'm on the controls flying, I can't hit him. So here's what I did. Don't touch that throttle. You want to wait until we're out of the icing, out of the clouds, be my guest. I can fly this helicopter on one engine, but not while we're in this icing in the clouds. You will not pull that throttle back while I am flying the helicopter. Look it up in the book. Well, the operator's manual for the Blackhawks about four inches thick. It is really hard to get to in the front of the helicopter. There's not a lot of room. He gets it out anyway. And he starts flipping through to find the pages I already knew. I just keep flying. And then we get out of the icing, out of the clouds. We can now safely fly on one engine. And I'm waiting for it, but it's silence. And then as we come on to final approach to Albany, New York, the capital, he pulls the book and puts it away. And then he clicks the radios. Crew chief, please write up this aircraft for a signal data converter computer chip malfunction. What a good idea, right? What a good idea. So we land, we write it up, we get the part in, and the colonel who's in the back, he comes up to me. Chief Mack, you're going to go here, here, here. Yes, sir, yes, sir, consider it done, sir. Derek, pilot in command to plan the mission. The next mission, the same thing. The colonel comes up to me. Chief Mack, you're going to go here, 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 here. Yes, sir, yes, sir, whatever you say, sir. Derek pilot in command to plan the mission. All week long, the colonel is coming to me. Do you question the colonel? Whatever you say, sir. At the end of the week, the colonel says, Chief Mack, in my office. That's a scary moment, right? Yes, sir. I walk in. Yes, sir. He says, Chief, you don't know me. But before I flew a desk, you see, as pilots, when you get high up, you don't fly anymore, so they call it flying a desk. Before you, I flew a desk, I used to fly Blackhawks too. I didn't know. Oh, that's cool, sir. He says, yes. And if you hadn't stopped Derek when you did, I was about to unharness from my seat, knock down two rows of seats, crawl over the crew chief, crawl over a center console, and stop him myself. <laughs> it's a good thing you did it first. You did a good job. And I have to tell you in that moment, my only thought was, oh, thank goodness, I am not getting court-martialed. <laughs> Insubordination. Mutiny, did I take over the helicopter? Impersonating a superior officer. Did he think I was the pilot in command for a week? It could have gone that way. And here's the thing. I would do it all over again because it was the right thing to do. 
I get asked a lot, what happened to Derek? Did he get in trouble? No. What happened to you? Did you get a medal or a parade? No. The fact is, all of us as speakers in this business and industry, there's not often a parade, is there? We often do what we do for just the quiet satisfaction of knowing we're making a difference. We're doing the right thing, and we're leading to a legacy. So I'm going to tell you about my leading to legacy very quickly here, because I believe in giving as a leading to legacy. So on your table, if you lift up the black napkin from the middle of your table, I have a gift for every single one of you. It's my book on keynote speaking. Thank you. <laughs> Did I teach you how to fly today? Yes. Well, what fly really means is to first lead yourself so that you can better lead others and lead in this industry and create your legacy. It's been an honor and pleasure to be with you all today and to have served our United States military. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. Amazing. Thank Everything you. I thought it would be. Oh, good. Yeah, that was really cool. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Cheers.